Welcome to Bloomberg Law on Demand. I'm Lee Pacquiao. I recently sat down with Peter J. Wallison. He's the senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also a former general counsel for the Treasury Department under the Reagan administration. We talked about the state of the United States housing market and the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Here's what he had to say. The reason that the crisis occurred was because initially government agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, FHA, the banks under something called the Community Reinvestment Act, were required by the government to make weak, low-quality mortgages. This started in 1992 with new legislation that imposed what were called an affordable housing requirement on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. now, but securitization those, existed before the government yes, got involved, right? It did, and, but it never was securitization for low-quality mortgages. Let me get to how that happened, because it's a very clear line from what happened in 1992 until what happened in the financial crisis. So the, uh, the government, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, FHA, the CRA, were making loans that should never have been made in the first place to people who couldn't afford the homes that they were buying. Mm -hmm. And that built an enormous bubble, a 10-year bubble, that began in 1997 and continued in two two th until 2007. In, in about 2002, we began to see the development for the first time in history of a private market in subprime and other weak loans. Now, why did that happen? It happened because the bubble was created in the first place by all of the money that the government was pumping into the mortgage market into low quality mortgages. So what was happening outside there? What were, what were investors seeing? When a bubble grows, it has one major effect. It suppresses delinquencies and defaults. Because as housing prices go up, a buyer of a home who can't meet his or her obligations can simply refinance the house or sell it without a loss. So investors looking at the market five years after the bubble had begun began to realize that here were high yielding mortgages, these were high risk mortgages yielding very good returns but not showing very many delinquencies. That enabled the beginning of this private market that you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. That's when Wall Street and, and Countrywide and the others began to securitize low quality mortgages. But the only reason they could do it is because the government started this enormous bubble with the tremendous investments it was putting into, um, into housing beginning in 1992. So there is, a, there is a direct line connection between what the government did earlier and what occurred in the 2000s. And if that hadn't happened, if that bubble had not been built, we wouldn't have seen the kind of abuses that actually occurred in the 2000s. What was it like working on the FCIC? It was uh, very discouraging. It was discouraging because the uh, people who were the majority, let me go back to explain what it was. The, the FCIC was made up of 10 people, six Democrats, four Republicans. I was one of the Republicans. Um, and uh, the Democrats had a majority. And they knew, I think, that they did not have to uh, care much about what the Republicans did or said. And so almost everything that I suggested, all the witnesses that I proposed, the ideas that I proposed, um, the commission look into, were completely ignored. And the, the um, report that finally came out was uh, just, just the narrative that had traditionally been, um, uh, been produced by the press and by others, mostly I have to say, on the Democratic or the left side, and that is that this crisis was the fault of the private sector. It wasn't the fault of the private sector. It was the fault of government policy that originally built that bubble. But I could not get the commission, even though I was a member, uh, to look into those issues. They just refused mm. to consider. Is that why you ultimately dissented? That's why I dissented. And uh, I, I still think anyone reads my dissent, uh, they'll find it very persuasive and also will find in it a lot of data that they can't find anywhere else. It was certainly not in the Commission's report. The Commission's report actually had almost no data whatsoever. It was just, I say, it was the longest New Yorker article ever written. Mm. 
Now, uh, when you were in your previous role as uh, general counsel to uh, the Treasury Department yeah. in the Reagan administration, what was the view uh, of, of your colleagues vis-a-vis uh, -vis the secondary mortgage market? Was this, were these problems on the radar screen? Was this yes. a concern? It was when I was there, even even in the 80s, and that was um, in in the in the mid 80s. From about I, I got to the Treasury Department in in 1981, and I left in 1985. But even in that period, uh, we were concerned about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But they were very powerful institutions. They were among the most powerful institutions in Washington at that time. Uh, not only because of political contributions, but because of networks that they had established. The fact that they hired people who were uh, very well known in Washington and were good lobbyists and that made them extremely powerful. They could also count on the home builders and the realtors to support their positions, the securities industry much of the time. So we recognized that unless we had a tremendous amount of political capital to spend, we were not going to be able to uh, reform Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, when I started working on this, when I left not only the Treasury and when I left the other things I did in the government, in the White House, and so forth, and when left private practice as a lawyer and started at AEI um, criticizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I ran into all kinds of problems. They didn't even want a private person criticizing them. Hmm. Um, so I, uh, I found that it was difficult, and, and uh, there were no changes of significance in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's regulation starting from the time I began criticizing them in 1999 until uh, 2008, mm. just before they actually went into receivership. So let's sum this up. We're, we're, we're still at this impasse uh, in the housing market and, and what we're going to do with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What are you looking for to happen next? Well, I'm hoping that the plan that we have developed at AEI will get serious consideration from the uh, Republicans in the House and that they will adopt our program, pass it ultimately, send it to the Senate, and then we'll have a debate in the Senate about this issue. It's, it's worth doing because up to now, the American people have already contributed $150 billion to keep Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac alive. Um, the estimates are that it will be somewhere between 220 and $360 billion ultimately. That's much too high a price for the taxpayers to pay for what we get from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and from government policy in general in the housing area, mm. which is very little. Uh, the United States is not a leader uh, in home ownership. We're about in the middle of the pack. Uh, we don't have the lowest rates for mortgages. We are actually well down on that list. Um, and we're the is only country that- Is encouraging home ownership still a good pu public policy oh, sure. in your view? It is, is that a something very good the government policy. should be in the business yes. of doing? Yes, the government should do that. But it is a social policy. It's not an economic policy. Hmm. And as a result, that is something the taxpayer should pay for. Um, what we should have is a system that is well understood, what the risks are, what the losses will be, because there will be losses, um, and that the taxpayers will take those losses. Because we think it's a good idea, uh, we Americans, that people who are of low income can start to own homes. Uh, because we think home ownership has tremendous advantages. It's good for neighborhoods, it's good for families, um, it's good in general for this, for this country, but uh, to, uh, to make loans to low-income people should be done by the government at the expense of the, t expense of the taxpayers, not, mm -hmm. as we've done it in the past, by forcing private sector organizations like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or the banks to make these loans when they're unprofitable. Mm. This is tough stuff, big issues and big numbers. But Peter, uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but okay. I want to thank you for coming in. This is really interesting. Good, thank you. That's Peter Wallison. He is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute based in Washington, D.C. If you'd like to learn more about the issues we just discussed, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.